Good evening, everyone, and thank you all for joining us tonight. Welcome to the Girl Dolphin Fly and Start recruitment webinar. I hope that you all enjoy hearing from our panelists this evening. Can I please ask that you note down any questions you may have throughout the night using the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. All your questions will be addressed in the second half of the webinar. I would like to start by introducing myself and the five other panelists joining me tonight. My name is Taylor Gilmore. I work for Godolphin Australia, based at our Kelvin side operation in Aberdeen, New South Wales. Part of my role includes the coordination of the Australian phase of Godolphin Fly and Start. I'm responsible for managing the trainees' time whilst in Australia, including the day-to-day -day running and organisation of program activities as they navigate their way throughout the, their five months' stay. Throughout the webinar, you'll hear, also hear from Clota Kavanagh, the Executive Director of Godolphin Fly and Start, current second year trainees and team leaders of the Australian phase, Caitlin Smith and Emma Coleman, Anna Power, who graduated July this year, currently the financial assistant at Arrowfield Stud, and Will Friedman, who we hope to be joining us shortly. Will graduated in 2018 and recently started his own training business here in Scone. Each of our panelists will begin by introducing themselves and covering a broad, ra broad range of topics, including the application process, what made them apply for the course, as well as some of their highlights and biggest learning outcomes. I would now like to hand over to Clota Kavanagh. Thank you very much, Taylor. Welcome everybody to the recruitment webinar this evening. Um, my name is Clota Kavanagh. I am the executive director of Godolphin Flying Start since its inception in 2003. At the moment, we've almost 200 graduates working in the thoroughbred industry around the world, 35 of which are in Australia and three working in New Zealand. And the vast majority of them are uh, Australia or New Zealand nationals. We're really keen to have more people from the Southern Hemisphere and indeed the whole area of Australasia on the Flying Start programme. And that's one of our reasons for having the recruitment webinar this evening. It's a wonderful opportunity that technology has brought to us to be able to meet you um, face to face. I'm based in Ireland. Um, everybody else on the on the webinar tonight is based in Australia, but in different parts, Sydney uh, and Aberdeen. Um, in terms of applying for Godolphin Flying Start, it's quite a thorough application process. However, we've streamlined it this year. Um, we've we're going to open early on December 1st. Uh, we've waived the small $10 fee that there was to um, get on the system and to apply for the program. And instead of having to provide written references from three referees, now you just have to provide their contact details and we contact them directly. So we're trying to make it, keep it a thorough system, but make it as efficient and, and easy as possible for you to apply. So taking down some of those barriers for you. I think if you want to apply for Good Off and Flying Start, there are two things that are really important. One is to look on our website and get familiar with our culture, with our vision and our values, and make sure that your um, approach and that your vision and values for yourself are aligned with ours so that you're comfortable on the program and you can enjoy it and you can flourish within it. Secondly, you need to have a very um, clear ambition that you want to be involved in the thoroughbred industry. You mightn't be speci specific about the kind of role you want, but you must know that you 100% want to work in the thoroughbred industry and how Flying Start fits into that career trajectory. Flying Start in itself is not a means, it, it, it's not uh, the be all and end all. It's not just doing the course and then moving on to do something else. It must fit in as part of your career tra trajectory. Um, and the last piece is, you know, look at our core um, modules. Uh, one is leadership and communication, another is bloodstock breeding and racing, another is business management, and then there's thoroughbred production and management. And make sure they're the things that you're interested in doing, um, because there's quite a lot of academic work as well as coursework as well as hands-on work as well. So if you feel your values and vision are aligned, if you really want a career um, in leadership in the thoroughbred industry, um, and if you feel that you will be comfortable and you will develop within those core modules, then hopefully Godolphin Flying Start is for you and we'd love to hear from you. Thank you very much.
So I can hand over either to, perhaps I'll hand over to Anna Power. Thanks, Clodagh. Hi, everyone. Um, as Taylor mentioned previously, I graduated from the course in July this year. We graduated via Zoom um, due to the circumstances with COVID. But uh, one thing I will say is that regardless of the situation, the team at, at uh, the Godolphin Blind Start work tirelessly to make sure that the experience is the best it can possibly be. I didn't feel like I missed out on anything, even though I was halfway across the world. It was um, a really great way to finish off the course. So I applied um, because I had heard about it when I was around 15. Uh, I grew up in the city, but I always loved horses. And I spent my holidays um, doing work experience at a breeding farm in the Hunter Valley. And then when I was in university, I worked for a trainer called John Thompson in Sydney. Um, and then I did some, I studied accounting and agricultural economics um, at university. And I did a placement at Arrowfield Stud. Um, and while I was at Arrowfield, I really was exposed to some of the graduates of the course. At the time, there were two graduates working for Arrowfield, Vicky Leonard and Andy Williams. And their knowledge of the industry and leadership abilities really inspired me and wanted me, uh, made me want to um, pursue my ambition to get on the course. Um, the application process was long, but it's so worthwhile. And my advice would be don't be disheartened or... Um, you know, overwhelmed by the process because if you just chip away and think of it as little little blocks and you do bit by bit, um, once once it's over, it's it's fantastic. Um, my advice would be to have a look at the CVs of the current graduate uh, current trainees um, to see kind of what the standard is of what what you might need or get some inspiration for different experience um, that you can get. If you've had a lot of office experience or maybe you need to have some time in a, a racing stable just to strengthen your skill set. So that would be my advice um, in regards to the application process. And just be yourself as well. I think sometimes people feel a lot of pressure to, you know, be a certain kind of person or um, have certain skills. But the course um, really caters for selecting a diverse group of trainees. So everyone has their own strengths and uh, you should be very proud of your strengths and be honest about who you are when you're applying. Um, the highlight for me on the course would have been, well, I had, my friends, I can't, I have to give them, a, them, them credit. I did the course with 11 wonderful, wonderful trainees. I was very, very grateful. Um, it was incredible to be with people who um, push you to be better and uh, inspire you. So that was fantastic. But also the personal growth, that was something I really, really didn't expect. Um, you know, if I, you, you think of Flying Start and you think of, you know, horse racing and leadership, but you don't, I didn't anyway, going into the course, think instantly about how I might grow as a person. Um, and I'm definitely, yeah, I'm definitely a better version of me coming off the course. I feel more confident. Um, I'm less critical of myself. And uh, no, it, it was the personal growth is, I think is a, a hidden a, a hidden um, gem that's part of the flying start. So yeah, that's my my little intro. Now I'm at Arrowfield again, uh, where I'm a financial assistant uh, working with the CFO and um, yeah, really loving it. Really, really loving it. So thank you. I don't know who I should pass on to next. I might pass um, back to Clodagh and oh, I'll pass on to Will actually. Will, Will can introduce himself. Hi everyone. Um, yeah, so I got it. I guess it's been a couple of years since I graduated. Uh, look, it's a tremendous course. It's It's got a proven track record. Um, probably what a, I, I mean, I came, I come from a racing background. So I had, racing's been involved in my life in some way, shape or form for a long time. But certainly no one thinks they're gonna get on the course when they apply. No one has this view that I'm in, you know, everyone goes to the interview and thinks I'm out of my depth. Everyone comes out of the interview and thinks I bombed it and I'm not getting in. Uh, and they select, you know, 12 people, 12 lucky people to go around the world and experience this tremendous course. 
So the thing that I'd pass on to, to most people is that if you think you would like to apply, there's no harm in applying. You can be told that you need to get some more experience here or some more experience there, but the reality is that if you don't apply, you'll never get the feedback to know where maybe some shortcomings are. And even to that point, there's no prototype or there's no criteria for getting on the course. They want an eclectic bunch of people, a group of people that can, you know, complement one another and have different personality types that stimulate discussion and change and leadership. Uh, when you first go on the course, I mean, I was only just saying it before, you think you know everything when you first start and then by the time you finish the course, you realise that there's a lot you don't know and that's fine to not know certain things. But uh, the one thing I've always been blown away by is the view that people think that they're not, you know, flying start worthy because there's no, there's no type of person they go through. If you look at even the current year, you find there's a whole different range of people from different backgrounds that want to go into different areas. Some people don't know what they want to do, which is great. You get exposed to everything. I just really encourage people to, to just apply. It's, it's, it, it'll take you, you know, the best part of an hour, an hour of your day to potentially have a very life-changing and life-defining moment where you go, go on the course it's the envy of a lot of people um, being such a, a tremendous success in this business and in this industry. Uh, and it's a hard industry. And if you don't have knowledge, you don't have power. So you've got to always keep learning. Uh, and this is just a fast track to that. Uh, it, it works for people that are 20, 20 years old. It works for people that have been 30 years old. It doesn't, it doesn't seem to have that people take different things from the course. That's the beauty of it. You're exposed to so much. Uh, I was very fortunate to work with some great trainers uh, through the course. I worked with Mike DeCock, uh, Willie Mullins, and even a flag starter, Tom Morley in America. It was, it's just building a network of, as much as it is meeting people, it's just meeting a, meeting a new network of mentors that you would never be exposed to. Uh, I've recently started my own training business and to be able to ask for advice from people all around the world that maybe have different perspective or different perspectives on different matters is a huge gain for me personally. And yeah, I've, it doesn't, it doesn't, I mean, there are a lot of successful bloodstock agents. There are a lot of successful trainers. You can go through all of the previous students, but, now, there have been some incredible successes outside of your big name, um, your big name graduates like the Adrian Botts and the Henry Fields in Australia. You, um, you can look at Vicky Leonard who started her own media company. You can look at, if you go internationally, even from my course, we, have, we had Tris Bowman who became a steward uh, and will probably become a very successful one in due course. But, uh, on the back of what Anna said, it was incredible to see the growth in other people, people that didn't have the confidence when they first started, realised by the end of the course how much knowledge they'd gained and how much more confidence they, they took from that. So, uh, yeah, to, to sum it all up, I, I would just really encourage people of all different personality types, of all different backgrounds, of all le different levels of experience, uh, I'll quickly tell you a story. When I went for my interview, I was sitting with a 28 year old from New Zealand who had been an assistant trainer for a very good, for a very good trainer, had uh, worked at some of the big studs. And I was another French girl who was in Australia as well that had a heap of background, lots of different bloodstock agents really intimidated me when I was at the interview. Well, they, they didn't get in. It's, it's just, it's not, it's not necessarily who you think gets in. I mean, we've looked at, we've looked at people that have applied. People always ask for advice on how to apply and what to do. And Anna's right. You've just got to be yourself because they're looking for a group of personalities that'll work well together because it, the flying start is a team. It's not, 
you just trying to make your own growth. It's about you, you being the class of X growing together. So if um, it's just, just be, be courageous and, and have a go at, uh, at trying to apply because it, it, if, if it happens for you and I mean, it'll only happen to a select group, but uh, if it does happen to you, it certainly will be career defining and probably life defining. So I'll pass back to Clodagh because I'm not sure where we're going from here. Thanks very, thanks very much, uh, Will, and uh, um, congratulations on your first winner in Scone this afternoon. Good job. Thank you. <laughs> um, well, why did we bring in this year's trainees then, Caitlin and Emma? And I'll ask uh, Emma to come in first, and then we'll we'll wrap up what we're going to say with with Caitlin, our Australian. Um, member of the team for this year, and then we'll hand over to questions. So, Emma, if you'd like to come in next, that would be great. Perfect. Thank you, Cloda. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Emma Coleman, and I'm from Dublin in Ireland. Um, and similar to Anna, I heard about the course when I was about 15. I was doing a week's work experience at Coolmore, and a family friend mentioned it to me, and I just thought that it was the most incredible thing. How could this course that's two years long, take you around the world um, where you get exposed to horse racing and the top jurisdiction, top jurisdiction. So it was probably always in the back of my mind that it was something I wanted to do. And then I went on and I studied equine business in Kildare in Ireland. And I was fortunate enough to spend a summer out at John Abel Farm, which is Godolphin's operation out there for a summer. And that was probably my first um, that was my first time working in racing within the industry and that, so I was 18 at that stage or 19 so I was pr probably pretty late getting into the industry and my passion for it just grew from there. Um, I was also lucky to get to do a year-long placement and I decided to spend six months in New Zealand at Curramore Stud and then I came over here to Sydney and I spent six months with Chris Waller and it just made my appetite grow even more for the industry and then um, I was probably a bit torn between if I was going to apply, probably like Will, if just, just apply, like there's no harm in applying. And I was probably considering maybe leaving it a year. I didn't know if I was too young to apply straight after college, but I just went for it. And as Will said, as, again, you don't expect to get it when you apply. You, you kind of cross your fingers, say a few prayers and hope for the best. And um, luckily enough, I managed to get a spot on the program. But um, yeah, don't I wouldn't be too concerned about timing and everything. If you feel it's the right time, apply. And if you're still maybe hemming and hawing about a little bit, there's no harm in just going out and applying and putting time. But definitely put time into your application process. That would be my biggest um, piece of advice to you all. It's not. It's definitely not an overnight job. I spend probably <laughs> hours on my CV and my cover letter and... I think another huge piece of advice I would say to you all is definitely reach out to the graduates or even the current trainees on the course. Um, they helped me a huge amount in my application course, uh, specifically Elena Cullen, who works for the TDN back in Europe. She um, read through all my, my documents in my CV, my cover letter kind of told me where I could improve on or just edit a few little things. And it definitely probably made me a stronger applicant going into the into the actual application process. And another thing I would say would be just find something that differentiates you from other people. Like we all love horses, we all love racing, but find something that makes you a little bit different. So for example, I love women and racing and I'm very passionate about education within the industry. And Caitlin, for example, is very passionate also about education and welfare. And I think like honing in on those specific areas because just little things like that just kind of make you stand out a little more so just keep that in mind during your application process too and also as Anna said try and mimic the template a little bit of the CV that's on the website because that just kind of points you in the right direction as to the pieces of information that they're looking for so it's very helpful when they um, the management team receive your CVs that they know that you've taken the time to look on the website and actually study the areas that they want to know about you and the different areas of that. And another piece of my advice was to get in touch with your references in time, but seeing as that's changed a little bit, you probably don't need to, but definitely notify them that they could be expecting a call so that they're not, <laughs> don't get too frightened when the phone call comes through. 
but um, in terms of the highlights so far, so we're second years now and we've been fortunate enough to get to Australia in the midst of everything that's going on. In Europe, so we spent like three months in Kildangan and then seven weeks out in Newmarket. And the highlight for me was definitely getting to go to the Orby sales and the Tattersalls um, full and mare sales. And I followed the same agent for both, uh, which was Philippa Maines and her mom, uh, Harriet Jellett. And I was just so fortunate that they were so inclusive of me during the sales. I was probably, I was very new to the whole sales process, but on, probably in the beginning was a little nervous of confirmation and pedigrees I was very weak on all that still I'm not an expert in any way but they were so willing to teach and I think that's one thing that I've definitely learned in the past year is that people in this industry love sharing their knowledge and they love helping people and I think that's something we need to be very proud about I'm proud of of being part of this industry that people are very open and approachable um, which has been incredible for me over the last year um, a funner element was probably getting to spend two weeks at the BRS where you, a few of us could ride, but some of us um, aren't maybe the best riders, but we had the funnest two weeks trying to um, increase our skills of becoming a jockey and a few tumbles along the way, but that was a very fun two weeks. Um, and then uh, I was lucky enough to do, when we were sent back from America and I was, um, we were, the course kind of continued remotely. We were lucky enough to do externships in our home country and I got to spend a month with Jessica Harrington and her team in Ireland, which was an incredible opportunity and probably one of the benefits from um, Corona making us all head back to our home countries. It's nice to be able to widen our network back, back home as well. And I'm so happy that we're back in Australia. I absolutely love the industry here. It is so vibrant. It's, I think it's just so different to anywhere else in the world. And I think all the trainees, quite a few of us have had experience out here before, which is nice, but I think everyone's loving it out here. And at the minute, I'm actually lucky enough to be spending time with Will. So I was there with him today for his winner at Scone. And it's little moments like that. You just see how much it means to Will, and even though I've only been there since Monday, it was such a big thrill to see him get his first winner there. And it's sharing those moments with people when you, you kind of have like the graduates and your trainees become like one big giant, it's almost like a big family that you can always reach out to and you'll always have that like support system around you. It was the same as Cloda and Martin and Melissa and Taylor here. There's always people you can reach out to. You'll never feel like there's a question that won't be answered or you're stuck on your own. There's always people there to support you. Um, so yeah, the time in Australia so far has been amazing. We got to go to the Everest as well, which was a huge highlight for us and definitely don't think COVID affected the atmosphere there too much, but definitely just on an end note, just apply, don't overthink it and if you want any help with any of the different parts, what you should concentrate on, maybe where you think you need more experience in, just touch base, send me an email, on, get in touch on Twitter. Me and Caitlin are more than happy to help in any way we can. And we hope that we see lots of applications from the Southern Hemisphere this year. Yeah. Hi everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, it's great to see plenty of, plenty of you on board. Uh, so I'm Caitlin. Um, I'm one of, another one of the second year trainees down in Aberdeen at the moment. Um, so I was fortunate, uh, like Will, to have grown up in a racing family, um, albeit quite a very uh, small operation. Um, but I went to university and did animal science um, with honours and then got some extra experience in other racing stables and a local stud farm at home. So I'm sort of a bit different than a lot of the people on the course. A lot of, the co a lot of my um, peers have international experience, but I didn't have that on my CV, which I thought was gonna be a huge downfall for me. Um, but I applied anyway, because I thought, um, you know, I may as well, what's the worst that can happen? And I think that's probably my biggest recommendation would be to like, there's no right or wrong way to get on the course. And I think that, sort of hones down onto being authentic and being yourself. Uh, so although it's good to mimic uh, the past graduates, their CVs, because um, obviously they've got on for a reason, I think it's really important to do what you think is right for you 
and what fits into your um, sort of realm of um, expertise. I would also uh, say to really familiarise yourself with the program and what it's about. Um, I definitely spent a lot of time on the website, um, you know, getting together um, different aspects of, you know, what the values and um, things like that were of the course before I applied to make sure it was the right thing to do for me. Um, I also utilise my mentors a lot. So I've got a very good mentor um, back home. Her name's Patty Campbell at Blue Gum Farm and she's been very, very good to me. Um, she's the one who sort of pushed me to do the program, even though I sort of doubted my capabilities. Um, but she certainly pushed me along and they generally, they always have the best, your best interests at heart. So I think they're certainly people you should really utilise um, and make the most of. Um, the other thing would be certainly attention to detail. It's really important to be very thorough in your application um, to prove that sort of, you know, you put the time and effort into it and that you really do want it. Um, I would say that was a huge, probably more of a positive thing of mine, even though I lacked that international experience. I was very detailed um, and made the most of the opportunity to showcase myself. Um, and then, yeah, just to finish off on the application process, I'd say the biggest thing for me would be the authenticity part. Um, just be yourself. Don't try and be someone that you're not um, and really play to your strengths. And, and you can't be arrogant, but you just have to promote yourself and be confident about who you are and, and really, really back yourself. Um, but yeah, it's um, an absolutely amazing course. The highlights for me would have definitely been a lot of things that Emma's already touched on. So sales, um, we got to see the Orby sale in Ireland, Tattersall's um, breeding stock sales, and then Keeneland in the new year in um, America. Um, so, and we'll get to follow some of the leading international buzzstock agents, which is an amazing opportunity. And then in terms of personal growth, I can't believe how far I've come since the first uh, few days of the course. Like I was quite a, I wasn't a shy person, but I probably a little bit standoffish in some, in some aspects, but I can't believe the confidence that I've got as a result of the last year. And that's just through um, the course throwing, throwing us in the deep end, putting us, ourselves out there, you know, um, presenting to industry people. It's, it, it is quite intimidating, but it's honestly the best thing you could ever do in terms of personal growth. Um, and leadership and then touching on the leadership the opportunity to lead Emma and I are team leaders at the moment um, so it's what we do is we lead the rest of the group throughout this phase and we're sort of the middle um, people between Taylor who's our coordinator for Australia and Clodagh and we feed things back to the group any issues and communications um, we sort of organize different aspects but that's been absolutely incredible to it's, you know, leadership on a smaller level, but it all really, really helps. It's going to um, definitely help me in the future for sure. Um, but yeah, I'm certainly looking forward to seeing more Australian applicants. I really push you guys to, to get on board. Australia certainly is one of the most prosperous racing jurisdictions in the world. Um, we're very progressive. We've got strong prize money, really, really good people. We're a vibrant young industry, as you can see. Um, so yeah, I really hope to see some applicants and as Emma said, please get in touch if you have any questions, always more than uh, willing to help. Thanks very much, Caitlin and everybody. boy uh, who majored in biology so there was a there was a wide group of us who didn't have any inquiry so no just a passion thanks very much anna yeah i would say from when we're looking at cvs in certainly looking at it to see mixes and uh, certainly find it more depends on the quality of the university and the result of the so the higher the result you want or university that's for its quality of teaching and quality of, that's what we're looking for as much as the subject of the degree 
Uh, maybe over to Caitlin and Emma for the best part and the most challenging part. I know you've talked about the best part for yourself. Talk about the most challenging part. Yeah, sure, Claire. I'll um, answer that one. So, yeah, the best has already been touched on. Um, obviously, the people we get to meet um, and the opportunities that we're given. There's things on the course you don't even realise you'll be doing. Like in England, we got to attend a, the Godolphin Education Forum, which was an international conference where all the industry leaders from across the world gathered to reform education um, and improve the industry's chances of retaining staff. Um, and that was incredible to be involved in something um, as international as that. So just that in itself is incredible. But in terms of the most challenging aspect of the course, it would probably be um, it's, it's quite intense at times in terms of time management. Um, so that's certainly a challenge um, for a lot of us, but it just requires us to have good organisational skills, good communication skills and really plan what we're what we're doing and what we want to get out of it. But I would say, even though it is a challenge, if you are passionate about the thoroughbred industry, it's a lot of, well, all of what we do is highly relevant. So it doesn't actually feel like you're, you know, doing an assignment. It's actually really, really um, engaging. Like this, this um, Australian industry assignment we did was to provide a um, plan for a future stallion prospect for Dali and set stallion fees and breeding rights um, nominations and um, a, a proposal for which stud he'll stand at. So like that is a pretty cool assignment to get. Um, it's just that they do come in at, at um, they tend to come in all at the same time. And I think that's a strategy of the management team to see how we cope. Um, but it's all really, really good for us. Like you'll be amazed at the end of it to see how you've improved in terms of operating at a really high level um, but um, uh, um, so touching on the best part you get to meet and the places that it brings you I'm a very people orientated person as it is and getting to share this journey with 11 other people of similar age similar passion and then also going out and yes you get to meet leaders within the industry and people who are very high up but you also within the different countries you go to, you end up making friends and you have developed networks throughout the different countries. And if you really like fast forward to 10 years, you'd hope that they're the people that you're going to be working with or they'll be working under you or you'll be working under them. So it's very important also to concentrate on maintaining and building a network of friends wherever you go also. So I think that's something that our group has done really well and that we've all thrived off and it's just, it's just so much fun. Like every, everything is amazing about the program, but of course there is the challenging parts too. And probably similar to Caitlin's, it would be time management is, it can be quite challenging at times, especially when at the moment we're out on rotation. So I start work at uh, 5 a.m. And then you've, I've, I'm lucky enough, I've got a break in the day so I can utilize that to do assignments and try and get some little job that I need throughout the day so Kate and I would have probably a little bit more work to do at the minute trying to organize alumni events and we have a conference coming up so it's it's just really trying to manage your time and another thing I would say that sometimes you probably feel like it's you're being exposed to so many different aspects that sometimes you can kind of lose the run of it a little bit so for me I love so many different aspects of the industry and I've been exposed to so many that sometimes you end up I suppose not becoming lost but you just become fascinated by so many different parts that you're like oh god I want to know more about that and I want to know more about that and that that for me is probably at the minute where my head is probably running loose a little bit and I want to know more about different parts of the industry just because I'm not entirely sure about where I want to go and that's also okay it, it's an incredible opportunity to figure out where you want to go but Sometimes it can probably just be a little bit overwhelming, but it's not something to worry about and you can definitely overcome it. And if anything, it's, it's you know, you can also turn that into a positive too. But yeah, those would be my two things that I'd find the most challenging at the minute. Thanks, Emma. Um, there's two questions here that I'll direct towards the graduates, perhaps Will and Anna. And one is fairly simple, where do you get to travel to? And the other is, where's the, what's the best region that you were in for you guys? Um, so I know this, 
it's pretty obvious with the course curriculum where you get to travel to, but maybe you can tell us a, a bit more beyond that. So where do you get to travel to and what was the best region for, for you, Anna and Will? Yeah, I'll start. Um, so yeah, you can read up on the website. Uh, I mean, for, for as long as the course has been around, we've gone from Ireland to the UK, to America and Australia, Dubai, and then back to Ireland. But there are some opportunities to go to France and there are some opportunities to go to Japan as well. So you're really getting a, a full coverage of world racing. I mean, there's uh, that arguably covers all of the major racing jurisdictions in the world. Uh, look, they all come, every region has its own traits and uh, its own pros and probably for people that are going from Australia, it's, you get quite a cultural shock in, in some of the places, particularly in Dubai, it's, it's quite different um, to what we'd be used to here or in New Zealand. Um, and even in America and, and the UK and Ireland, probably slightly similar in their cultures to Australia, but the, the, the parts of the world that stood out for me were the ones where you got that cultural shock and you really had to absorb the different ways of uh, not just racing, but just living. Um, the American people are a very friendly group of people, but they're obviously they, they're dirt racing. So it's very different and they're very passionate about American racing. And as, as we are about Southern hemisphere racing, it's, it, you sort of, you, you're proud of whatever you brought up with. And that would probably be another thing on the course that you, that you need to keep in mind is that not just people on the course, but everybody is proud of their racing jurisdictions. And you have to be very uh, sensitive as to how you talk about other people's racing because they've grown up with it. It's their pride and joy. And like we have in Australia, we're very proud of what we do here, but I would definitely, to answer the question, back to the question, I would definitely say that uh, I found Dubai, looking back on the course, I mean, while you're, while you're doing the course, there are pressures and different parts that make some parts more enjoyable than others. But the being in Dubai and seeing Sheikh Mohammed's, what Sheikh Mohammed's built from nothing and how racing survives without gambling, which is very different to Australia, um, is really eye-opening and you look back on the course and while you're there, it may seem normal at the time, but you look back on it and, and think that was something that not many people got to experience. And just to, to go back to maybe some of the things that you should look at before you apply to the course. And I think it's just out of respect to Sheikh Mohammed, you should really get to know what Sheikh Mohammed's values are himself, what he stands for uh, and why he's actually started this course which is to grow racing because it's a large part of his life uh, it's a very very privileged honor to have a man who doesn't know us intimately um, to fund us to travel around the world it's it's a I would just say out of respect it's it, it's worth taking some time to see the incredible feats that he's done so I'll pass on to Anna thanks Will yeah, I'd agree with everything Will said. Um, Dubai is it's very, I'd say it's a very special place. Um, it, it's very, like, despite being, you know, recently developed in the scale of, of countries around the world, it, it's got a lot of culture and history and it's a very interesting place. Um, places that uh, I got to travel while I was on the course that aren't on the like prescribed list. So in America, you're based in Kentucky. Um, but I got to visit Florida, I visited New York, I visited uh, Nashville in Tennessee. So I got some time to see a bit more of America. And I did my um, five week US externship in California at San Anita with um, Hall of Fame trainer Richard Mandela, um, which without a doubt was the highlight for me. I absolutely loved it. He is just such an incredible horseman and to have the opportunity to spend um, so much time with him every day and to learn from him was just absolutely incredible. And so if anyone's ever thinking of um, 
thinking should they go to Santa Anita, I would highly recommend it. It's a stunning racetrack um, and really like really just really, really interesting um, people so dedicated to their horses. Um, yeah, no, so Santa Anita was a real highlight for me um, just because I got to learn so much and really experience American dirt racing. It was great. Thanks very much, Anna. Uh, questions are rolling in here. I think there's one here that Taylor could answer for us. And it's just, um, say, Taylor, how much of the trainee's time is spent in the training room or having lectures or workshops or um, that sort of thing? And, and how much is spent outside with the horses or on visits? Sort of an approximate breakdown or what it looks like for the Australian phase, at least, which probably reflects the rest of the phases. I think it would be probably 80% um, practical, 20% theory in Australia. You probably, um, so we have an induction week. Oh, there's two weeks of inductions really. So um, it's all the basic, um, I guess, processes and procedures within Godolphin. And then you move out to, to uh, visit all of the practical, uh, sorry, the Hunter Valley, leading Hunter Valley stud farms and learn from all the key industry breeders around the area. Um, you'll move into uh, practical rotations, there's externships, um, you do a module, a week-long module at the Macquarie University in Sydney on leadership and motivation. Um, there's also a conference, um, a week of um, Godolphin Management workshops where you apply uh, five different, um, so it's finance, IT, uh, bloodstock, uh, HR and WHS, um, to a mini business plan to then present back to those that manager, managing group um, within Godolphin. Um, you also spend some time with Godolphin nominations team. Um, so it's very well rounded. Um, yeah, I hope that answers the question. Thank you, Taylor. Um, maybe one for Caitlin and Emma. Um, Caitlin, if you'd take the first part, what was the most challenging part of the application process that you found you needed to dedicate more time to? And then, um, or maybe we'll do this the other way around, actually. Emma, if you wouldn't mind answering that. And then the second piece I'll give to Caitlin, because it talks about, have you found the course is touching on lifetime care internationally? And is this a, as high a priority as it is becoming in Australia? So the application piece for Emma, and then maybe the lifetime care aspect for Caitlin. Is that okay? Thank you. Um, I'd say for the initial application process, so the cover letter I think has to be two pages long which if you look at it is it's a lot two pages is quite a lot of writing but it's also not that much if you're trying to get across your personality your experience your goals within the industry why you're applying what appeals to you within the program and I think the cover letter Cloda and Joe who do the interviews and the different representatives and the um where they do the interviews so all all around the world they met the majority of you ever so you really need to create who you are and put it on a piece of paper and i think that's why some people mightn't spend as much time or don't think the cover letter is as important as maybe their cv or something but for me i spent the definitely the most amount of time on my cover letter and I gave it to several people to read and also people who aren't in the industry and they would they would look at um, applications to jobs on a regular basis and they can give you feedback into it and it's good to get I think and what skills you might need to add in to it and just generally structuring your cover letter so I found that probably um, just kind of get my final old draft of that ready to go it's an, it's an, a start shouldn't be an over two years is a very long time to a course it's a commitment on to the that has been built It's a, it's a commitment to your, your own personal life and your professional life. So I think if you're really dedicated and really 
truly want to get on the course, you need to think about it way in advance. So yes, applications are opening in, opening, are they opening in, no, already open? First of December. Yeah. Yeah. So December. you don't want to be putting your application in on the last week. That is absolutely just don't, there's no need to cause that stress in your life. I'd start even working on a little bits as weeks go by, doing an hour here or 20 minutes and just try to get your application in and just be happy with it and read it over as many times as you can or not too many times because then you'll just become a bit of a perfectionist about it. But yeah, I would say definitely that was the most challenging for me, the cover letter. So and yeah, I'll dedicate time to the second part, which was touching on lifetime care. Uh, so it certainly is something that we do touch on. And to answer the second part, it is a huge priority internationally. Um, it's probably one of our most discussed topics when we travel around the world. Um, certainly is the biggest in Australia and is becoming probably the biggest in Ireland, England and America as well. Um, so we, like in the UK at the Godolphin Education Forum, although it was centred around education um, and retention of staff in the industry it had a large focus on our the perception of, which is large from an animal welfare perspective um, so around the world which was uh, uh, Ingalls really actually considered in these approach not us down at the time and listening um, our voices are definitely heard and I think we're very appreciated to have that sort of younger um, demographic lens on the industry, um, just coming from a different viewpoint. And then in England, we also visit the Godolphin retraining facility. Um, so where all Godolphin's horses are retrained from. Um, and although it's internal with Godolphin, it gives us ideas of how we could apply it to our own individual countries as well. Um, in America, we go to the Secretariat Centre, which is a independent centre which retrains um, retired thoroughbreds um, and rehouses them to external homes. So that's another really good opportunity to see the, the good to, to our countries as well. Thank you very much. Um, there's a question here then for um, the graduates, either either Will or Anna can take this one. Uh, looking back on your time on Flying Start, what would you have done differently or better with the benefit of hindsight? I'll, I'll have a crack at it. Um, okay. I don't think I'd do anything um, you know, I definitely tried my best, so I don't think I could do anything better. But differently, um, I had some good advice before I went on the course, which was, you know, at the end of the day, you're going to remember the people you met and the, um, you know, the networks you formed over whether you got, you know, 85 or 90 in uh, an essay. Um, so I would probably have stressed less about making sure everything was 100% perfect and really just soaked up um, the networking opportunities a little bit more um, because once you're off the course, you realize how spectacular they are and um, what a unique experience it was. Thanks very much, Anna. And there's a question there for you, Will. Um, did the course influence you to become a trainer or did you know you wanted to train from the outset? Uh, I went into the course probably wanting to be a trainer. <coughs> Excuse me. I probably realized how little I knew pretty quickly um, when we started. Uh, the, the course exposes you to so many different... Uh, firstly, I should say, 
just basing it off my experience, probably isn't a very big sample size. Plenty of people start the course wanting to be bloodstock agents, trainers, and realize during the course that they actually want to do something else. Um, probably one thing about the course to keep in mind is to, it's great to have ambition and a view that you want to do different parts, but the one thing, and just to touch on what Anna was, um, the question Anna was asking is, I really wish that I started the course with a more open mind to everything else. I was very horse racing training and didn't, didn't give a lot of time, like a lot of thought to other parts of the industry to begin with. Um, but you learn very quickly that on the course that you need a broader understanding of everything is much more beneficial to you in every job you start in racing. Um, but did it in the one thing that was a huge benefit to starting to becoming a trainer, it's, it's all well and good to become a trainer, but the, the hardest thing about becoming a horse trainer is the business aspect of, uh, of being a horse trainer, um, is understanding your profit and loss margins, budgeting, uh, having a business plan. We do, you do a business plan in the last sector of the flying stars and whether or not it's to do with what you want to do after the course, it just shows you the thorough nature of what is entailed in a business and understanding where your pressure points is in business are. So some people will go on the course with a business background and that's fantastic. That'll take you quite away. But for myself, I had a journalism degree uh, and I really found that last module quite intriguing because it, it really set me up to be able to go in and start my own business and be confident that I like it'll survive. Uh, so, uh, did it influence me? Of course it influenced me. Uh, seeing great trainers, it gave me other training techniques, little things to, to keep in mind where to pay attention to detail when you train. Uh, it, it, I, I wouldn't be in a, in the position I am now without the flying start, I would have spent a lot longer trying to figure out different elements of training racehorses uh, that was just accelerated by the flying start. Thanks very much, Will. Um, there's another question here, which would probably be good back to um, either Emma or Caitlin. <clears throat> Is there any particular preparation you'd suggest for the interview? should we be successful in being invited for one? Is international understanding of particular importance, for example? So any particular advice for the interview, if you're invited? Because I th think you've talked a bit about the letter and, and that already, but specifically for the interview. And their second question is, is international understanding of particular importance, for example? So which one of you would like to um, take that one? Um, so for the interview process, just to give you kind of a breakdown of it, you'll, um, if it's the same as it was for our year, you'll have, um, it's about less than an hour written exam. And this exam is very much focused on your own racing jurisdiction. So it's um, country based. Um, so you'd want to be quite familiar with sales results, race results of that year, um, stallion premierships, first season stallions, the good two-year-olds and three-year-olds of the year and kind of the winners of the classic races and the big group ones. They, they can, it's not challenging. I probably spent too much time studying for that written exam and was reading the TDN and the Irish field and the racing post so far in advance and keeping notes and like continuously looking back at them. And I think that you don't need to go that in depth into it probably there's key things that will come up and also some bits on general management of horses like feed and um like course for trainers and it's just it's kind of basic things and another really important thing for your interview process i would recommend everyone to be very familiar with the graduates in your country their roles and kind of the impact they've had on the industry because the the actual alumni network and the, with the graduates is very important to the whole value and ethos of the Flying Start. So definitely do your research on graduates and reach out to the graduates. I 
Um, there was one girl who, Lucy, who was in the year above, so she graduated with Anna. And I'll just never forget, she told me that she got her hair blow dried and washed her car before she went. So it just kind of highlighted how important your actual presentation of yourself is on the day for, for the interview. Um, at the end of the day, it is a professional interview and just make sure you dress appropriately you hold yourself together well and just little things like that. It's very easy to um, stand out from the other applicants within your own interview group. And then after your, sorry, back, after your written exam, you'll have, you'll do a presentation. So it's, it's about a five minute presentation and you'll get given that about a week in advance. Um, so just make sure you really practice that um, practice it for friends, family, even if they're not really listening. It's just good to actually speak it out loud because um, nerves can get you on the day, but once you've prepared and then um, just be ready to um, maybe have a few questions to ask about other, for other presentations and just be, make sure you're listening to the other presentations would just be another point of advice that I'd um, put out to you all. Um, and in your action, then you'll have your own individual interview. So this, this can basically be guided by you and the path that you want to go down. And it's just ultimately, it's just Cloda and the interview uh, panelists wanting to get you, wanting to get to know you on a more personal level. It's not long at all. I remember coming out of mine thinking, I think I was in there for about ten minutes. That was just a chat. Like I don't even remember what I said. So just it goes by very quickly. So make sure you do get what you want to say across. Um, but yeah, just do a lot of research in those areas I'd recommend. And just your biggest asset is us and your graduates. Just reach out to as many as you can. And we are so willing to help with anything. If you have any questions about the interview process or the presentations or anything, we would more than happy to help you with any of that. Okay. Um... Thank you very much. I'm conscious with our panelists, our busy people and probably people watching in as well. We didn't want to go this much. We wouldn't, we didn't want this to go much over an hour. So there's five or six questions here, which I think I can answer fairly quickly. And they, they got to do with more the running of the course and, and the future of the course. So what costs does the scholarship cover? Um, covers almost all costs. Um, your housing or your utilities for your housing, um, your transport, including car rental, fuel, tax and insurance, flights, uh, legal fees for visa applications, you know, immigration agents, covers health insurance for the two years. Absolutely everything you can think of that um, might cost you a lot of money, all the big costs, and there are no course fees either. On top of that, trainees get an allowance every month. So really it's more like a job than being in a, a university situation or something like that. And the idea of having all of that financial support is that there are no barriers to entry for um, people who don't have a lot of money in the bank or can't afford to pay to do another course that this course um, um, provides all of those supports and an allowance every month so so you can attend. So it really makes it very much equal opportunities. Um, so that's that one done. And um, can I apply right after I've graduated from high school? Well, my understanding would be for high school, I'm assuming this is somebody who's maybe 17, 18, 19 years of age. Um, no, it would be highly unlikely we would take someone straight from high school. Um, we are looking for people with at least one year's work experience in the industry. So that would be after, uh, after school or after college. We're also looking for someone who um, has a level of training probably after high school and need necessarily be a bachelor's degree, but it could be five or six years in the workplace plus um, um, some sort of other training, for example, an Irish National Stud or English National Stud type course or Marcus Oldham or something like that. So um, generally the people we take on would be in their early, mid and late 20s. That's the normal age group. And to gather the amount of experience we want and the amount of um, education and w w whatever that balance is, it's usually around that age that the people are successful in applying for um, for good off and flying start. Um, um, 
So uh, how many people apply? Uh, in around 100 every year uh, is the number that apply. Um, and the Sydney interview, um, there's a couple of questions here. Where does it take place? And who are the panelists? Um, usually either Joe Osborne or myself or both of us are do the interviews and quite often we're joined by one of the principals of uh, Godolphin in the particular area we're interviewing in. So in Sydney, it could be one of the directors of Godolphin and all myself or Joe Osborne. Usually we have two or three panelists uh, for, for the interviews. Um, how many people apply? Okay, done. Uh, there's a, a question here. What happens if you've been working in the industry for your whole life? and come straight after high school, is that okay? So I think what this means is somebody who's done high school, but then has been working in the industry for a number of years. Um, if you look on the website, there's, there's three basic criteria, three different uh, uh, portals, I suppose, for applying. One is if you have, um, if you've completed high school and completed a degree and you've one year's work experience, um, if you've completed an honours degree. The next one is if you've completed high school and completed a past degree and then you have to have three to five years experience. And the last one is if you've completed high school to a good level um, and then you need to have five to ten years experience in the industry in order to uh, be eligible to apply for Flying Start. It might sound a bit complicated but go to the website, have a read of it and please get in touch if you need any more detail than that. But there are ways to come into Flying Start with just a high school education. You must have performed to a high level and you must have significant industry experience on top of high school. Um, and the last one here um, I'm going to answer is what will the impacts be of COVID-19 on the 2021 to 2023 course? So that's for people who are applying from December 1st this year and who would start the course in August 2021. Um, it's very hard to say what impact COVID-19 will have uh, for next August for two years um, after that. Um, what I will say is we've managed to cope with whatever COVID has thrown at us so far. Um, we've had to adapt. Uh, we've been able to deliver the main parts of the programme, both practical experience and academic so far. So we're very positive about being able to deliver uh, on the 2021 to 2023 course um, with, with the way COVID is, you know, the world is coping with COVID at the moment. We hope that things will look a lot better by next August. Um, dif difficult to answer that one right now. Um, and one last question then, has anyone completed another course like the Irish National Stud and would I recommend that as a learning experience step before applying to Flying Start? And the, you know, the Irish National Stud or, or the English National Stud or someone, someplace like Marcus Oldham, these kind of courses here have huge merit. Um, they can be good stepping stones, but equally we, we look at, you know, working for a top farm or trainer for six months or a year um, just as favourably. Um, however, those courses bring other benefits, you know, perhaps of um, a, a peer group around you or an academic side as well. So certainly all of these courses have merit and some of them have been used as stepping stones to get off and flying start. Um, so just to wrap up, maybe um, one last bit of advice from Caitlin, Emma, Anna and Will, Justin, a very short sentence or a few words. So Caitlin, if you just give a few words of encouragement or advice to anybody who's watching in. Uh, I would just say if you're positive and enthusiastic about the thoroughbred industry and it's a um, career path that, you're def that you definitely want to go down, whether you know exactly what you want to do or not, um, definitely apply. There's definitely no harm in doing it um, and you just never know whether you'll get, get on. It's the best opportunity you'll ever get. Thanks. Thank I'll go next. Um, I would say don't compare yourself to others. Everyone's different. Everyone has a different um, level of experience and knowledge within the industry. And when you start applying and you find out who's applying from your country and the experience ha they've had, it's very easy to get worked up about it and be like, well, they know so much more than me. 
I, I shouldn't apply. Just, just really don't compare yourself to other people. You are an individual, treat yourself as an individual. And as we've repeated several times throughout this webinar, they're looking for different personality types. People have different, different capabilities. They don't want a finished product. They want someone that they can develop. So that would be my biggest piece of advice to you all. Thanks, Emma. Um, my piece of advice, seconding what the girls have said, uh, would be ask questions. Ask, ask questions to your boss at the moment, to people who work in the industry, to graduates of the course. Um, learn as much as you can. Make sure it's the right fit for you. And um, yeah, just keep asking questions. Keep learning. Mine's a little more lighthearted. Just, I can't talk for women, but for men, have a shave and then get a haircut. That's what I, that's what I You're bringing some of my pet hates to the table, Will. Um, look, I, I'd, like to, uh, I'd like to thank the panellists, uh, Caitlin and Emma, our second year team leaders, for um, being with us this evening, putting the effort into answering the questions and preparing. I'd particularly like to thank Anna and Will. Will, as I said, just trained as first winner at Scone only a couple of hours ago and then had to go and deal with a storm as well. And, and is very busy in her role in, in Sydney, I know as well. So really appreciate you guys bringing, you know, that reflective piece of being able to look back and, and have a bit of humor and, and wisdom as to what were the highlights and what were the tough parts of the course for you. Um, of course, Taylor, who is our rock in Australia and organizes everything with, um, with um, so much good humor and efficiency. So Taylor, thank you very much for being here today. And then, of course, behind the scenes, we have Martin Larkin and Melissa Steele, you'll see down there at the bottom, who um, Melissa looks after recruitment for the programme, actually. Um, and we're going to have another seminar for Northern Hemisphere applicants in a couple of weeks, and Melissa will be a panellist on that. And Martin's looking after all the tech here today. So, and thank you to the nearly 40 people who attended the um, seminar um, today as well. We hope we hear from some of you. Uh, applications opening in December 2020. Thanks again, everybody. Bye-bye.